uh, Muhammad Gutsal. Muhammad, he is a third year law student from UITM, originally from Shamban. Um, his previous yeah. speech is one of the most decorated uh, debaters that we have, not only in Asia, but also arguably around the world. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the yoke of patriarchy is cemented by an ignorant populace. That is why education policies do not look at individuals, but instead look at generations. But they don't look, just look at this generation, but they look at generations ahead. So when you look at the scale of the issue that the opposition chooses to ignore in this particular debate, we're just not talking about hundreds or thousands of people suddenly becoming uneducated and maybe not getting a job, and that's the worst case scenario that we're looking at. What we're looking at, ladies and gentlemen, is entire generations in the future, decades on, cultivating a culture in which families or individuals are built, or even communities, ladies and gentlemen, built surrounding around patriarchal structures around uneducated men, only furthering perpetuating the very same patriarchal structures that you create under that side of this debate. That is why you need to create a fundamental break. And how do you create a break from that culture? You only can create a break from that culture in the way of which education can exclusively can. So On the opposition, they told us we can create this awareness of gender parity and gender equality in many different ways. Notice, the opposition never gives us any of those alternatives in this debate. They tell us that perhaps you can, but Jasmine provides you actual analysis as to why university level education is the only platform in which you critically analyze and finally engage in a mature demographic of individuals that can actually understand what equality means. Try explaining to a 13 year old what feminism means and you'll get them running around the room and throwing blocks at you, more likely, ladies and gentlemen. And that's why, we, and that's why ladies and gentlemen, that we think that the opposition needs to be responsive to the scale of problem in which men Sure, they might not be a disadvantaged group in society, but it is certainly important to educate them in order to ensure that other Sir? disadvantaged groups are not continuously disadvantaged in the future. And that is why we think that it was insufficient for them to respond like that. So the problem that exists in today's debate is not that men are excluded actively, ladies and gentlemen, but they're excluded through the omission of policy and, education, uh, and educational structures from encouraging them to go to a further education. I'll be talking about one thing in my speech, which is how do we change the behavioral patterns of the male population when, uh, when addressing education. But firstly, I want to address this one point that came from the opposition, that apparently we need to help and address the access of education for other minority groups. Firstly, ladies and gentlemen, Aborigin, Aboriginals, poor individuals, and other minority groups, guess what? Those people have men too. That means that if we have a quota for men, there are still men who are poor, and men who are indigenous individuals, and are probably will be able to help those minority groups as well. But we're talking about women, ladies and gentlemen. Women are not disadvantaged, and I'm, I promise you I'm not sucking up to uh, what we do so here. That we actually think he's doing a very good job when it comes to yeah, higher yeah. education. Yeah. Systematic, systematic <laughs> oppression when it comes to access to education. The sheer statistic of women being 7 to 1 in its admission, ladies and gentlemen, in higher education shows that there's no barrier to entry when it comes to education. Women face barrier to entry in the workforce, ladies and gentlemen. That's why women oftentimes don't access work or promotions in many circumstances. And in that scenario, we need to choose where we target which minorities we're helping. When it comes to education policy, Clearly the minority and the person that's clearly oppressed in this particular circumstance isn't women, but it's obviously men. And then if we're talking about the workforce, then we can cater to women in that particular circumstance. That is why we thought it was important for the opposition to be to actually actually, you know what, before it is four minutes, I'll take you on. So when more men enter university <coughs> to learn about machineries, and when less women now have access to this subject, how are they getting the exposure to learn about gender equality then? Um, a, but ladies and gentlemen, a quota to access higher education doesn't make you have to choose which course you have to go in once you go into university. Yeah. So don't know why. Yeah. Um, ladies and gentlemen, so how do we change the mentality of individuals when it comes to the male population? Very quickly, ladies and gentlemen, that when you look generations on, when men are building families, raising their children, 
of even talking to the communities and leading communities, ladies and gentlemen, because let's acknowledge that patriarchal structures mean that even uneducated men will oftentimes leave communities at many points in time, because we're in this hall, I would indeed. Um, so in many circumstances, ladies and gentlemen, we need to ensure that these individuals, these community leaders who fundamentally shape the next generation are individuals that are not left behind in a cycle of being uneducated. Because it is within that cycle that education policy does not change. Men don't choose to not go to university. People have, men have less better results after secondary school. And I think many people that work in the education sector will know this. And that's why they don't get admitted into public, uh, public universities. How do we change that? Is by making the men of the future tell their children that maybe you should focus in secondary school. Maybe you should learn more when it comes to that circumstance. And maybe that's a priority. <coughs> because if you don't, ladies and gentlemen, then nothing changes. And you have a perpetual cycle in which men continuously become uneducated, but leave the country being uneducated. I'm exceedingly proud to propose. That government needed to prove to us how education per se would guarantee that all these educated men would understand the concept of gender equality. They have just proved to us how these men would merely enter those classes even though uh, they can still choose not to care about what you're teaching them. Right? What would I say in today's speech? Number one, I'll ask you, how do we change the behavior of men in society? And secondly, I'll reiterate what it means to have a quota system and how they're compromising the, how they're compromising the pillars of a strong quota system. First of all, let's talk about the behavior of society towards women. Because God says, look, if men are educated, they will understand the intricacies of gender inequality. We don't think that's true because it's not exclusive under their side. Under our side, we can continuously educate men through programs, through, uh, through campaigns telling them why women are equally deserving of everything else. They have yet to prove to us how once men feel entitled that my government is providing me a safe space in a university, even though I did not work hard in middle school, even though my sister worked more hard and yet she does not get a quota, is when you entrench the feeling of entitlement that these people have. Under your side, you cannot assure to me that these men will understand the concept of gender equality. But under our side, we can assure to you that these men are going to feel entitled. Why is entitlement so harmful? Because we think that it doesn't need ed you don't need education to understand the concept of entitlement. Because you know that I am deserving of this spot and my government thinks that I am a better student than other females who work hard in their middle school merely because of the fact that I am male. We, do we think it makes it worse when these men go to the job sector and they feel that they're entitled to jobs even though there's a woman in the interview who has the same credentials and CV as them. And companies who hire, who hire more men because they feel entitled to have men, more men in the more men in the working sector because through their years government has told them that men are deserving of this and the only excuse that they're willing to tell us is because we have to teach them about gender equality without proving to us how exactly are, are you going to teach them gender equality when you continuously remind them that even if you don't work hard enough it's okay because the government is going to let you enter university in the first place so that's how we ensure not only the feeling of entitlement but more so complacency because there are young boys who will not work as hard in middle school because they will always know that there are spots reserved for them in high school and they don't have to work harder than their sister whose quota is now taken away. And lastly, we think stereotypes are broken under our side when men realize that there are equally competent women who can take away my spot in a university. These are intelligent women who can also enter the same spot as me. That's when you break the stereotype that there are not enough intelligent women who can compete with you. When you tell men that your position in power, your position of intelligence is equally threatening, is equally threatened by a woman, that's when they realize that I am not entitled and I am not the sole intelligent person in this university, but women too can take away this spot. That's when you break stereotypes and men realize that women should be not only deserve to be educated, but maybe more deserving than me as well. Therefore, we think that's how you change the mindset in society, and government has failed to do so. Before I move on, any questions? But the stereotypes that you break are for people, men that are already in university. For those men that are rejected and still live in their couple and uneducated areas, are those individuals going to see the fruits of breaking your stereotypes? But under your side, you didn't prove to me how through a quota system, all these companies...
welcome leaders will somehow enter university in the first place, right? We think at best you have some more men entering universities, and those men, the feeling of entitlement that they have, the stories that they narrate to their children and their societies that I got this spot even though I did not have enough marks, is more damaging under your side, the stories and the narratives that they can run on the ground. And secondly, let's talk about the quota system, because we don't think discrimination is as systematic as facilities not existing for women. We can see facilities exist, but women face a higher social barrier to entering not only the job market, but the educational sector as well, because they have to convince their mothers, they have to convince their families that you have to spend on me, that I'm willing to delay some years of marriage or some years of housework because I want to get educated as well. Men don't face those type of barriers to education, and we don't think they face the barriers or the discriminations that, that women do. The first extremely unfair for you to tell them that merely for changing gender disparity we want to we want to end we want to give you a free ride into your university hoping that you will understand the complexities of the problem at the end of the day quota system is to solve injustices we don't think there have been any injustices proven by side government as to why men shouldn't enter university merely because they have made the choice not to enter the university because that essentially means you get education. I wish it was that simple, right, to create gender equality. I wish it was as simple as giving people lessons in medics, giving lessons in law, lessons in economics for people to immediately understand the roles of gender and to realize that there should be equality between sexes. Unfortunately, given the fact that we have excellent economists, we have excellent doctors who currently still are sexist, tells you that this education, in and of itself, is not a reason and how you gain gender equality. It is about specific education, which usually institutions lack because they take it for granted. What sort of education do you actually need? Maybe more debates talking about edu like the importance of gender equality. Maybe more campaigns on like female empowering talks. But never just about giving them a free way to get to enter into university. Because all that means is that they now get to go to class learning about how to operate a person's body, but never about how you respect a woman's body. So we don't necessarily think that this education in and of itself creates gender equality. So at best, I think secondly then, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that maybe this happens through their interaction. Because when you go to university, there are you know women. Government laughed and said, yeah, but quotas don't tell you which course you take, so clearly there are still less women in engineering. Yes, that's true. But without the interference of your policy, more women stand the chance to enter engineering. Because mathematically speaking, when there's a higher pool of women, there generally is a higher likelihood of more women also entering into courses that are currently dominated by men. But thirdly, they said, yeah, okay, but if you have a problem with men, you do realize that the current quotas that you are okay with include men, aborigines, poor individuals, the disabled. Yes, on top of that, you are going to add more quotas for more men on top of the current men who are already entering through the quotas of the disabled, through the quotas of aborigines, through the quotas of like the poor, and through individuals who probably don't go through, in, through quotas, right? On top of that, you're gonna add in a fifth quota that says men now should enter because of this quota. That essentially creates a like imbalance. The reason why I am not willing to fight for this quota is because I think, we think, that women currently, even if they are outnumbering men to a certain extent, I actually don't think that it's the worst case that could ever happen to Malaysia or to any other country. Given the fact that men have a lot of access to opportunities and advantages even when they don't go to universities, given the fact that they have support of their families and societies, probably the fact that women get tertiary education in numbers more than men isn't the worst thing. When currently women are already pushed into a perception that whether you go to university or not, you are expected to put your family first over your education. We think that at least when you have more women going to education because of the non-interference of your policy, it at least gives these women an empowering choice to later on feel that if I don't want to make like my life just about being at home, I have a degree to go out there. I don't stand a chance 
getting like hard labor job as it is, like these are usually jobs that don't require degrees because people think women are weaker. And if I try to go to the service-based industries, they don't accept me because I don't have a degree in comparison to men, where even if they don't have a university degree, there's still a very high likelihood that they can still find means to sustain themselves and their family because society gives them that opportunity in comparison to women. This is why. Probably it doesn't sound very intuitive to think that, why should women just generally now be flooding the universities? But when you look at the bigger picture and the sort of excess of opportunities that they have, this is literally the only opportunity they have. For these reasons, I'm proud to propose. We have a more optimistic view when it comes to the education side. Girls perform better at primary school. Girls perform better at secondary school. Girls definitely perform better in universities. I should know. I have three women debating with me. I guarantee my CGPA is the lowest between all three of them. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, that the problem of women not getting jobs later on is a separate issue that's dealt with separate policies in this particular day. But when it comes to education specifically, it's about dealing with the men that are in the most patriarchal, most bigoted areas of Malaysian society, which aren't the people that are already in your university. They are people who get rejected. They're the people that live in the kampongs we obviously always forget when it comes to us building our education policy. These are the people that don't get the education that they wanted, and these are the people that you don't get breaking stereotypes, making people know that they can be engineers as well. Because all they know is the surroundings, uh, their surroundings, the lack of education they have, and in many circumstances, poverty. We know ladies and gentlemen, for a fact, that oftentimes a lack of education drives poverty. And we also know that poverty oftentimes drives bigotry as well. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, it was important for the opposition to acknowledge that this debate is a balance between having some perhaps more women in engineering versus an entire generation of men that were systematically uneducated, still going to be community leaders and going to create terrible policies out of, uh, out of stemming from that lack of education, ladies and gentlemen. And that's why their failure to acknowledge the scale of the problem of leaving behind men was an issue in this particular debate. Secondly, ladies and gentlemen, we will concede from the government, we cannot guarantee that men will learn about feminism when they go into university. It, it's hard for us to say that when you learn about surgery, you're going to pick up a book about, uh, about feminism in that particular circumstance. But what can we say will happen at the worst case scenario for us? The worst case scenario is at least these men become more educated. Number two, become more socially mobile. And number three, probably become more economically stable. These are prerequisites of individuals that will more likely than not become people who are more open to ideas of gender equality. Because this debate is a comparative. We have at least some educated men on our side of the house, but on your side, you're still going to leave these men behind. They haven't told us in the 14, the, the 10, now 40 minutes of speeches that are given so far, how do we address men who will continuously become community leaders, still remain uneducated, and these are individuals that are going to maintain their privilege, as Amira would like to say in her reply speech, and still disadvantage women at the end of the day. Fundamentally, ladies and gentlemen, this debate needs to acknowledge that it needs to be a break of the culture, of the discouraging of men from accessing higher education. Men don't not go to higher education because they're lazy. Okay, maybe sometimes. But men oftentimes don't go to higher education because there's a culture of not pushing men as hard when it comes to primary school, not pushing men as hard in secondary school, or maybe it's the construct of educational policy that doesn't cater to the different, different developmental stages of men in comparison to women. These are nuanced ideas and points in regards to how we cater educational policy in regards to gender. But those things are not addressed if you don't first have a critical mass of educated men and a continuous trend of uneducated men controlling society on that side of the house. I've never been prouder. Thank you.